Father, in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, we honour you, we bless you, we give you all the glory. Thank you, O oh God, for this another day that you have made for us. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you especially for this gathering this evening, our Health Matters Mondays, Lord God, where we're looking at staying healthy in these difficult times. Father, we thank you that your word declares that it is your wish that we prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. And so, God, as we gather, I pray that we'll be enlightened, encouraged, revived and strengthened, and that we will have new zeal and commitment to do all we can to be healthy, both body, soul and spirit. Bless our doctor who has come to share with us this evening, Dr. Carol. We thank you for her and for every participant, every household and family that's represented. God, we give you thanks and we pray, Lord, that we'll have a grand time of learning and sharing together. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Kay. Thank you. So, Saints, we're here tonight. We're going to be having a session on heart health. And so without any further ado, I'm just going to um, just to give you a little bit of a background um, into our speaker for tonight, Dr. Carol Ikafosi. Um, she'll be our presenter of this health and well-being session. And just to give you a little bit of her history, Dr. Carol is a mother, general practitioner, author, speaker, and company director of Lidimed Limited. She is also a missionary and an ardent advocate for heart health and was recognized and awarded as a British Heart Foundation Heart Hero finalist 2021. In her local church, which is Bethel Numa Tabernacle Church in Leicester, um, she serves in capacities of adult Sunday school teacher, church secretary, president of the local women's ministry, she also serves at the Bethel, Center, Bethel Central District level in the capacities of leader of the Bethel Central Wellbeing Team and the first Vice President of the Bethel Central Women's Department. Dr. Carroll has worked in a range of primary and secondary care settings over the 30 years spanning her professional career. She currently works as a sessional GP in urgent and primary care in Leicester. Additionally, she has experience in a variety of clinical specialities in secondary care, including psychiatry, psychiatry, sorry, pediatrics, obstetrics and gynecology, and medical research with a focus on asthma, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Dr. Carroll's passion for general well-being and women's empowerment issues is reflected in her first two books. Following a heart attack just over four years ago, she wrote the book, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, The Heart of the Matter. She has used this book as a platform to highlight gender health, inequalities, particularly as it relates to women and heart health. Her second book, Can Women Have It All? published in February, 2022, highlights selections of her personal experiences, encountering and overcoming crises in life, and revisits the age-old debate about women's role in society and what is expected of them. But her enduring testimony is, God has been good to me. She strides forward with her life's motto, in hand and heart, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4, 13. So we're going to have an interactive session this evening. So um, if you do have a question, you're very welcome to use the raise hand functionality and also your name and say who you are and you'll be able to um, ask your question. You can also please put questions in the chat to Minister Erica. And at the end, she will be asking those questions on your behalf. So once again, it's going to be an interactive session. Please use the raised hand functionality. And when you're asked to speak, just say your name and ask your question. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you all, Dr. Carol Igofosi. Bless you, Dr. Carol. Thank you very much, Carol. <laughs> My name's 
thank you. I'm, I'm giving God thanks for the opportunity to be here this evening to share with you. And I'd like to greet you all in the name of Jesus. I also bring greetings from my pastor, Elder Delroy Hunter, from here in Leicester, Bethel, New Tabernacle. Thank you to everyone who's taken the time out to come. I'm usually very happy when people take time out to look, uh, you know, to care for themselves. So without further ado, I'll go into the presentation that I've got prepared. Okay, so as was mentioned earlier on, we are looking at the title of Keeping Healthy in Difficult Times. And I'm specifically going to introduce some what I'm referring to as lifestyle lifelines. I heard Sister uh, Minister Kay in her prayer mention the scripture, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, which says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's just reminding us that we are not just physical beings, we are tripartite beings. We've got body, soul, and spirit. But whilst we're here on earth, my pastor says, whilst we're living in our earth suit, then unfortunately we're subjected to all sorts of diseases. Lots of things happen, all sorts of heartaches, all sorts of difficulties, but we have to negotiate those. But we know that our Father wants us to remain healthy, not just our spirit, but our body, soul, and spirit, so that when he returns for us, all of these will be blameless. And tonight, we'll be specifically looking at how we can keep ourselves healthy. We'll be looking at specifically the body, but bearing in mind also our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotion, and of course, or you know, goal is always to remain healthy spiritually where we have a connection and maintain connected to our heavenly father. So at the end of this session, I'm hoping that those of us who are here, individuals who are here, will be able to at least define some key terminologies that I'll mention and we'll be able to contextualize difficult times. We say we're facing difficult times. Just put a little bit of context to that. Just look a little bit at traditional health and well-being practices and strategies. You know, what have we done in the past? And am I bringing anything new to you this evening? Perhaps not much. But what I do hope is that I will at least put things into a sort of a framework, if you like, so that it will be easier for you to recall things that I've said if we have a framework, usually that is easier to do. And maybe I'll bring you some new information. But as um, Sister Carol mentioned earlier on, it will be interactive um, as much as we possibly can. And I will be looking for us to having a lovely time. So the first interaction, what is health? Have you ever thought about that question? What is health? Anybody would like to offer an, an answer to that question? Elder Carl. Wholeness of being. Wholeness of being. Yeah. Okay, so health is wholeness of being. Thank you, Elder Carr. Anybody else? Okay. So we have a standard definition. It's part of the World Health Organization's constitution. And they say that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So the car said it's wholeness of being. So that was a good answer. 
many have argued whether or not it is time to revisit the definition of health. For example, in, in, in my brief biology that was read, or not too brief, you heard that four years ago I had a heart attack. But if I were to meet you on the road, or if you didn't hear that, and you met me, would you look at me and think she looks healthy or not? So there is an argument as to whether or not the state of complete physical, complete physical, mental, and social well being should still be used as the definition of health, or should it be changed to a, a state of managing whatever health challenges there are? That's an argument that's being put across. I just want you to think of it. But basically, the World Health Organization is in keeping with the Bible in that it's recognizing that it's not just an absence of disease or infirmity, not just an absence of physical challenges, but it's a state of complete state of physical, mental, and social well being. So, taking into consideration that man is not just a body. So, when we talk about well being, I'll just go on to that. That is incorporated, as you can see, in the definition, in the health definition. However, just looking a little bit closer at it, the CARE Act 2014 and a little bit, a little bit more information that I've put together sort of just coins what we mean when we're talking about well-being. It's a broad concept and it describes several areas. So it describes our personal dignity, physical, mental, emotional health, spiritual, social, and economic well-being, protection from abuse and neglect, participation in work, education, training, or recreation, having control over one's day-to-day -day life, and the individual's contribution to society. So all of these things, need to be considered and none of them is placed in any higher hierarchy than the other but in order for somebody to say that their well-being you know their their well-being is is good they're enjoying a good state of well-being all of these things need to be taken into consideration so in terms of context i've been asked to speak about staying well or staying healthy in difficult times now i'd like to hear from you what what do we mean by difficult times what what what's making these times difficult and maybe different from other times so I'll in, i'd like to invite your comments on that sister claudia um i think um difficult time it could be financially it could be um people are very um not able to socialize as they used to be so like the shut-ins it's affecting them emotionally physically because they're not able to go out so i think it's seen as um hard times what we're going through now thank you very much Mr. Torres. very good so because of isolation and maybe financial pressures. Thank you. Any, anybody, anyone else has any? There's else? a raised hand from, sister, from Minister Maxine. Go yes, ahead, Minister Maxine. Yes, um, I was thinking maybe the increase of uh, mental health. Okay. Issues. Okay, so the increased prevalence of mental health in the society, more people, are being diagnosed, more people are admitting, maybe. Um, so yes, so there's an increased prevalence of mental health disease. Thank you, Sister Maxine. And yes. also in the chat, uh, Dr. Carroll, uh, not able to make ends meet and being socially isolated. Okay, okay. So yes, so all of these factors, some of these factors are new to the times, but some things are, have been there before. Sometimes 
different individuals have not necessarily experienced particular things. I'm sorry, Dr. Carol, you have a raised hand. I'm sorry, from Catherine. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Go ahead. Um, yes, the culture that we're having to live in now, which is completely counter the Bible. So um, it is very stressful. Okay, okay. So different um, philosophies coming to the fore, um, different ideologies and um, these counter biblical teachings. So they can be difficult for us, all of us, but I, I suppose we, we tend to see it having more pressure on our young people more so because you know, of their vulnerable state and trying mm -hmm. them trying to form an identity at this. Uh, sorry, can I just add, it's very difficult in the workplace. Okay, would you like to elaborate a little bit, Catherine? Um, because people are constantly, for example, uh, trying to force you to put pronouns um, <coughs> in correspondence. I don't need to put pronouns <laughs> and I won't oh, be putting oh. pronouns, that kind of thing. And trying to force this whole, uh, you know, um, LGBT agenda. Okay. It's not that anybody wants to uh, be mean to anybody. However, people forcing their ideologies on you. Right. Okay. The whole zero sum gain thing. Okay. Thank you for that. So again, this is something that is more prevalent in our society, because of course, like you said, it's, it's encouraged, you know, for people to speak up. We're talking, we talk about well-being. Well-being, one of the, 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 the tenets that I read is about having a voice and being able to, 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 to make your voice be heard. So all of these take into consideration all of these things. So it impacts differently on individuals, but all these put together, I suppose we can all agree that yes, it is difficult times, but difficult, I want us to appreciate for different people in different ways. And not to mention recently, we had a pandemic. We're coming out of it. We're at what we call it endemic state at this time. COVID is still around. That impacts on our health, not just our physical health, but our psychological well-being. Somebody mentioned about isolation that has continued for some people. We're currently in a, being impacted by the, the Ukraine-Russian war that has in, yeah, impacted on our bills, you know, et cetera. And so, and all of these things put together, but generally speaking for children, as children of God, I'm sure we'll recognize that we're in end times. The Bible says these are perilous times, but, we will do whatever we can to maintain positive outlook, to remain healthy, because ultimately we want to be ready when, when the Lord returns for us. So I've got this question here, how have we been managing? And I'm just going to ask again, a few more responses, because yes, we've got some of these things that are new, but we've always had challenges throughout life. The Bible tells us, especially that as children of God, we should count it joy when we are faced with diverse temptations. We are always challenged one way or the other. How have we managed in the past? And can we bring some of those things to today? Sister Eileen. I think in the past there was a, um, I, um, I can be corrected if I'm wrong, there was a greater sense of community okay. and the extended family, family was very imminent. You had the grandparents, parents, aunts and uncle, everybody was contributing wow. to the well-being of each other. Now we have more a nuclear family and people are living distances of, away from each other. So isolation and that um, change in the structure of that community structure has impacted on health. Okay, thank you very much for that, Riley, yeah. thank you. So mm -hmm. change sometimes breaks down in the family unit. 
is the Karen Powell. Yes. Um, if you've got like an, an illness or you're coming down with something, now you can um, you can go on the internet now and you can search uh, what sort of disease or what you're suffering with and you can get uh, information of um, how you can, what you can take for it or any sort of maybe herbal remedies or, or how best to treat it now. So the, the, the internet now is, is, it has a lot of information about that to help you. Okay, so we've got access to information, a plethora of information, um, including to manage our health. In the past, yeah. how, how was that dealt with? Right, me, me personally? No, just generally speaking, how, how, oh, did, right. how did individuals deal with health problems? All right. It, it, anybody can answer. Okay. Um, I think oh, um, Claudette. Sorry, Sister Claudette. Um, probably in the past, um, we would um, seek doctors' advice, or um, our parents would, um, like, if you're young, they would then advise you on things to take. And um, but majority of the time, you would seek to go to the doctor. Where now you have information at your hand. But in them times, we used to more or less go and seek help, hospital, doctor, or wherever. Okay, okay. So family and also using the professional. Thank you. There's a raised hand was, from Minister Kay. I believe Calvin was before me, Brother Calvin. Um, yes, I was just about to say the use of the doctor, but... Going back to the internet use, it certainly has been helpful in getting information generally, but sometimes it can work against us as well. We might get a little bit of information and end up misdiagnosing it ourselves. So it's a, it's a case of balancing what the internet, you know, especially medical, what the internet gives you basically, and, and getting professional help at the same time rather than just relying on what the internet is because you can end up just misdiagnosing yourself and then get into a state. So I yeah. think you still need to seek professional help as well as using the, using the internet. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much. Um, yeah, I was going to say that how we perhaps managed more in the past was that people were more reliant on um, home remedies, herbal remedies, bush remedies before we had so much advancement in, you know, pharmace pharmaceuticals and such the like. Um, I think a lot of cultures had their own, um, you know, remedies on how they do things, you know, the different herbals that we could use. I think nowadays we've kind of been more reliant on pharmaceuticals that are made and created in labs. But I do see a big sort of um, 180 now, a movement where people are going back to nature as it were to um you know look at the natural remedies for health and um, we've seen big rises in natural remedies natural hair movement um becoming vegan and eating natural foods the raw food diet so i think that was how we've managed before but i think it's coming full circle that we're um going back to those things now <laughs> yeah thank you so much for that thank you um, so lots of information here, and I think basically what we what what I'm getting is that in the past, well, we're as human beings, we're we're resourceful, and we've always been resourceful. Like I said to you, I'm not necessarily going to bring anything new. The Bible says that there's nothing new under the sun, and as Minister K mentioned, there is a, a one hit degree turn in the sense that we're sort of going back more to nature and to natural things. So yes, so we'll we'll tie up all of those when we come to how March, we will oh, manage May, today. June, July, August, September. Okay. Okay, so so let's move on. Why is it necessary to keep healthy? As time is, is I'm gonna ask just, just for some quick shout-outs. Well, why do we bother? about keeping healthy, well, what's the importance of that? 
are high because we need nutrients for the body to operate properly in the way that it should. Okay, thank you, Mr. Andrea. Another shout out. Sister Claudia, we need also to be able to do our chores for the day or whatever we need to do. So we need our health. Okay, so we need new trends to keep healthy. We need we need new trends to reach for, to give us energy to, to keep healthy. Yes. There's a raised hand from Minister Maxine. Minister Maxine. Yes, I was just going to say uh, long life. We're okay. Thinking about you know, being healthy. Okay. Long so long life, healthy status will improve our longevity. Elder Carl Sinclair again. Elder Carl. First, there's a philosophical one. Health is your wealth. Um, makes, if you are in health, um, there's possibilities um, all around you that you can take advantage of. Yes. Without that, yes. um, there's not much else you can do. You can just hope for the best that things turn around. But health, as I says, it's, you know, it's everything which it hinges and all that you do are impact on all that you do in life. Thank you so much, um, Minister Carr. Yes, so all of those things, you know, some, somebody mentioned about it preventing diseases. So it prevents disease. We, we had the pandemic recently and like I said, COVID is still around. And a lot of people died from COVID, but that was a, an acute, where a stage where we had that specific viral disease that was rampant at that time. But the number one thing that people are dying from in the world, according to the World Health Organization, is what is what comes under the, 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 the group of chronic diseases. So though we had that spell, COVID is not the thing that people are dying from every day. The number one cause of health specifically in the world is cardiovascular diseases. And that comes under the umbrella of chronic diseases. And so chronic diseases are the things like diabetes. Cardiovascular diseases include like um, heart, heart attacks, heart failure, Things like high blood pressure will come under that as well. So these are the things that, that human beings are dying from. And so if we can find a way to prevent us getting these diseases, sometimes it's not necessarily preventable because sometimes individuals can get these diseases without any apparent cause but they are largely preventable. They are largely prevented. And that is one of the things that we'll talk about. So having the knowledge of what the number one cause of death is, cause of death in the world is, then we can do something to prevent that. So it's about preventing the diseases. And of course, when, and of course, when we have the diseases, it makes our life less enjoyable. As Minister Carl said, if you don't have health, you know, life is sometimes even questionable about, you know, how whether or not you it's it's how whether or not you, you how you live it. I won't say whether life is worth living because, you know, once when, when you've got Christ and you're able to tap into certain things, then you can always find something to be grateful for, and life can be can be manageable, but we don't just want to, to, to exist, you know, or survive, we want to thrive. And so that is one of the reasons why we need to keep healthy so that we can enjoy the best of our life. We can enjoy the best job. We can avail ourselves to all the, the amenities that are available to us, that are available to us so that we can have a, an enjoyable life. It improves relationships to family life. If a parent is ill, for example, it puts pressure on family life. Children may find themselves becoming carers. And it's just not nice when a parent is ill. My mother died when I was 10 years old and she was unwell for a few years before she died. And even at that 
tender age, it is still imprinted in my mind, the difficulties and the struggles that my mother went through. And the, I, I remember very vividly how it affected us as a family. So being healthy means a better life for relationships and for family life. Health is wealth, again, uh, Minister Carl, in a lot of ways. If you're healthy, you can work, you can have a good job, you can, like I said, avail yourself of, of education, training, et cetera, that are available and improve. You can you know, embark on entrepreneurial activities and in, increase your earnings. If you're not well, if you're not well, you can't do those things. We have the NHS, so we don't necessarily pay for healthcare upfront in England, but in other, in other societies, people have to pay upfront for healthcare. And that can be absolutely draining. And just things like, you know, having insurances, paying for insurances. If you've got certain chronic conditions, those things will cost you more. So being healthy will save you money in a lot of ways. And one thing that is common nowadays, we are always talking about the environment. We're as children of God, we, we don't worship mother nature, but we do have a responsibility to look after our environment and just eating healthy. Um, Minister Kay mentioned about going back, people going back to plant-based food. If what is happening and what has, has, has spiraled all these chronic diseases predominantly is the, the, the number of, or the amount of processed foods that we find ourselves eating in today's society. And those come with processing, meaning using you know, energy and the gas emissions and then all the packaging and all of that sort of thing. So that impacts on the environment as well. So keeping healthy does have quite a few benefits. Uh, Dr. Carroll, before you move on, you have a couple of comments uh, based on the last statement. Okay. Uh, pre it prevents diseases, improves your mental health. Okay. The body needs all the health, nutrition for growth of the body muscles, etc. If a person is living a healthy life, eating well and making sure they are getting a lot of fresh air, walking regularly, but still encounters having a heart attack, what else could have been the cause? Okay, we will come to that. That's a very good, good point. I'm, I'm going to ask, if I don't specifically mention that, please remind me because that's a very good question and it's a very good point. And I can tell you that's been exactly my story. <laughs> okay, okay, so that's very good. Okay, so like I mentioned earlier on, the definition of health by the World Health Organization indicates that health is the, the, the absence of disease and infirmities, but the complete um, absence of those. There's a complete state of well being. That's not the reality of many people. That's not my reality. That's not the reality of our aging population. So when we're talking about staying healthy today, in these difficult times. We're all experiencing the isolation and the financial pressures and the, the different ideologies that are coming up in society and all these things that you mentioned that are pressing on us. But how do we go about staying healthy? So if we've got chronic diseases, for example, in order to stay healthy, we need to be able to manage those. I've had a heart attack. Once you've had a heart attack, your heart muscle is damaged. There are degrees of damage that can be done. And um, my story is such that unfortunately, I do have a degree of heart failure because of the, the primarily because of the delay in, in getting treatment. And that is one of the reasons why I do talk a lot about heart health. And um, because, it is important, for example, that if you have, if you think you're having a heart attack, that you get the treatment as soon as possible because it can re result in more damage than would otherwise have, co have caused. But if you've got chronic diseases, it means you're not gonna fold your arms and give up and say, woe is me, oh my God, I've got chronic disease, I can't do anything. You have to manage it. 
So it's about managing chronic diseases. If it's about maximizing function. So my heart muscle is not as it were a few years ago, but what do I do? I don't just sit down every day and leave it to you know, continue its demise. I have to do exercises to strengthen all the other muscles in my body, but also my heart muscles. So it's about being aware of all those things. If you've got diabetes, for example, sometimes it might affect, it could affect your vision, for example. And if that has happened, it's, it's about managing whatever function is left to try and prevent further deterioration. If you've got arthritis, managing your weight, for example, will help that. Arthritis, for example, of the knees. If you've got excessive weight, then that will put more pressure on that. So it's, when, you've got, when we've got things happening to us, things that have occurred, it's not the end of the world is what I'm saying. We need to maximize whatever function we've got left. Optimizing medication regimes. And um, Minister K mentioned about, um, you know, people going back to using more natural remedies. That is true. And, but there are medications that have been proven and tested, gone through the, the, the you know, the, the pharmaceutical regimen. And we know that they do work. For example, the tablets that I take, I know that they have been through all the trials and they do work and they work for me. So I don't, I don't omit taking my medications. If you, if you are at the place where your faith is such so that you feel you don't, you can manage without medications, then you know, that's for you to negotiate. But in, in, a, in, in, in cases where medications are prescribed, taking your medication to maintain your health, to staying healthy is very, very, very important. Prioritizing different health risks and outcomes. So just being aware of what risks are and Avoiding risk, we'll talk about some things when we go in a little more into lifestyle. But just being aware, we talk, we, we had we talk about COVID, we had a pandemic. We had to do what we had to do to avoid getting the disease. And nowadays it's so prevalent, it's like a part of our lifestyle. We have to learn to live with it. But still, we do take precautions. And especially if you're living with a chronic disease, you know that your risk of getting complications from things like those will be increased. So you try and manage those. And I've got here preparation and end of life considerations. Again, if you're living, even if you're not living with a chronic disease, in order to stay healthy and stay healthy means that your mind, not just your body, is also at ease making facing the reality that unless the rapture comes, all of us are gonna die at some point. So if the rapture comes at this moment, then we won't have faced death, but otherwise we're all going to face death at some point. And maybe we don't necessarily think about these things, but certainly for me, before I had the heart attack, I thought about making a will, but it was like, oh, I'll do it at some point. But after that, I made sure I did that. But we shouldn't just leave those kind of things until you know we've got such major health events. Just preparing for for our loved ones who we may leave behind. You know, it makes sense doing these sorts of things. And for me, having done it, it means that I am more at ease because I think if I should go, my children have this, 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 this is, is in place. Things are in place. So maybe we think about those things as we get older, but whether we think about them, them then or whatever stage of life we're in, they do contribute to us staying healthy because it means that we, it's less stress if we're more relaxed and comfortable in our mind that things are in order. 
So going into what we call lifestyle principles in staying healthy, medications work, all of those things that I've mentioned, but there are lots of things that we can do to prevent becoming ill. And if we are already unwell for whatever reason, we can minimize relapse occurring or minimize further complications. And there are five lifestyle principles that I'd like to talk about. I call them Lidimed lifestyle lifelines. My company is called Lidimed, and some of the things, especially the relationship, bits, I've added in. So when we, we, you know, at medical school, you get taught about certain things, eating, so diet, movements. We didn't get taught a lot about sleeping and relaxation and relationships. Those things weren't mentioned too much, but because of my personal experience, having seen patients, you know, realizing that chronic disease is, is the number one cause of death in the world and having myself experience what I experienced, I realized the importance of lifestyle principles. If we could actually put these things into a pill, they would be more effective than a lot of the tablets that we take, but we do unfortunately neglect them. So the eat, and that refers to our diet nutrition, move, that's referring to exercise and activities, sleep. When I was at medical school, you know, it was a big thing if you didn't sleep a lot and you stayed up all night and you studied. And even in the workplace, I've heard people say, oh, sleep is just to rob us of our time. And you were, it was seen, sleep was seen as something that is for the less robust among us. But that is such a myth. Sleep is important. It is important for us to relax and it is important for us to pay attention to our relationships. So we'll talk a little bit more about these five lifestyle principles. Eat, move, sleep, relax, and relaxation, and relationships. So in terms of eat, it's about our nutrition, it's about our diet. We've had lots of comments from you about the importance of getting the nutrients that we need to stay healthy, to energize us. And I've got jerk, I've heard that recently from something I was listening to, and it basically means just eat real food. And I thought that was quite, quite good because it just, you know, just with that one, one, um, what you could call it an acronym, it just gives you a lot of information there. So if we think about diet, it's quite a divisive thing. You know, you, there are so many, so much information and people say this one is good, this one works, this one, People, you know, can get on the internet, for example, if you go on there, there are so many debates about which is good and which one works, et cetera. Personally, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to individuals. So I'm just going to ask individuals just to shout out what, what type of diets are you aware of? What are some of the names that you've heard as it relates to diet? Protein diets. I beg your pardon? Protein diets. Protein diets, okay. Thank you. Ketone diet. Ketone diet. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Paleo. I'm sorry, Mitch, I didn't get that. The paleo. Paleo diet, yes, thank you. Pescatarian. Pescatarian diet, yes. The Atkins diet. Atkins diet, yes. Carb free diet. Carb free, did you say? <laughs> yes. Yes, thank you. So low carb or carb free diet. <laughs> Okay, so that's just giving us a flavor of how many dietary uh, diets there are out there, how many dietary patterns. And we could look at all of them and I've seen where a lot of them, most, a lot of them have had some amount of research 
um, put in into people coming up with these type of diets and they are beneficial in some way. So the keto, the ketogenic diet that somebody mentioned looks more at using fat for energies rather than carbohydrates. Um, paleo diet talks about going back to ancient times and eat what our forefathers used to eat. But we've got vegan, vegetarian, somebody mentioned pescatarian. Um, so all of those low fat diets, um, low carb diet, lots and lots and lots of diets comes into place. But the bottom line is most of them have some benefits, but not, I don't think there is a one size that fits all. And if ketogenic diet benefits somebody, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be on that diet and that it will benefit you. So it is a, it is a, it is a case of individualizing your circumstances and um, having you know, talks with your healthcare um, professionals to get additional information as is necessary. So I don't want us to get too hung up on which diet we're on and that we must eat this diet. And I'm certainly not gonna send anybody to, to nutrition hell if you don't have, you're not on this type of diet or that, because I do believe that at the end of the day, it is quite individualized. I'll go down to talking about the Mediterranean style diet in a little while. But because of, of diet, one of the things that cause chronic diseases a lot is the process of inflammation. Now I've got the term diabetes. It is not a proper word. It is a coined phrase which incorporates diabetes and obesity. But these are two conditions that we know contribute a lot to chronic illnesses and put us at risk of getting other conditions. And if, for example, you get um, COVID with these conditions, your risk of getting complications is more. Just things like getting Alzheimer's disease, dementia is increased if you've got these kind of chronic diseases, so diabetes and, and being obese. And there's a state of pre-diabetes. So when somebody doesn't necessarily have the diagnosis, but they're at risk, that in itself as well is a concern. And basically the reason why it is so important for us to have a proper diet and why these conditions cause so much problem, as I mentioned before, is because of the inflammation that is caused when we eat the wrong foods. Inflammation is a good thing in an acute situation. So if I cut my finger, my body is such that it should start an acute inflammatory process and the blood cells should start migrating to the area. The clotting system should kick in and the, it should start bleeding. And that is good inflammation. But when you've got chronic, slow burning, ongoing inflammation, which is what unfortunately a poor diet contributes to and what our current lifestyle in the West contributes to, then that causes a lot of inflammation, predominantly because it allows for the increase of a hormone in our body called cortisol, which is, a, you could call it the stress hormone. So if, when our forefathers, you know, didn't have this kind of lifestyle that they did and they had to hunt, we talk about the hunter gathering um, type of life, they would come across, you know, wild animals, et cetera, and they had to care for their family. So if a tiger attacks somebody or a tiger is seen, then cortisol kicks in, adrenaline kicks in, and that is to enable the fight flight response. And that's appropriate. That was appropriate then. But nowadays, we don't necessarily need that level of cortisol because we're not necessarily exposed to that level of risk. But what we have is a lot of stress. And that goes back to the question that the person asked. When you're doing what you deem to be good in that you're dieting, you're having good diets, you're exercising, et cetera, but you still end up with something like a heart attack. The bottom line is inflammation. Stress is a big thing. And when there is a level of cortisol that is remained at a certain state in the blood, 
it causes inflammation and inflammation wreaks havoc with our cells. They don't work as they should. Um, specifically with our diet, it affects our gut. There are normal bacteria that God put in our body for to stay in our gut and keep our gut healthy. We refer to it as the gut microbiome and they have their own DNA and produce their own metabolites, their own byproducts. Those are put there um, naturally to remain and keep our gut in a healthy state. But when we take a lot of antibiotics, when we eat certain foods, it damages our gut lining. So the permeability of our gut changes and we end up with what something we call leaky gut. This is all quite new. We're learning more about this over the last 10 years. And as a result of leaky gut, we can end up with more inflammation because things that should stay in the gut are getting into our bloodstream and they affect all parts of our body, including even our brains. It's men, it's, it's believed according to research. And so diet is very, very, in important. So you may think, okay, I shouldn't have a lot of uh, sugar, so I'll have artificial sweeteners, but even those unfortunately affect gut permeability and can cause this inflammatory response. So we just have to be aware and be careful about what we're consuming. We mentioned the various types of diet. A Mediterranean style diet is deemed to be generally what seems to, to have the principles of good dietary principles that most people can adopt. So it is agreed, generally speaking, that the Mediterranean style diet, and I say Mediterranean style diet because of the, the principles of that diet, seem to be one, if you think, if you, if you like, that you could say fits a lot of ills, is suitable to be incorporated for most people. And the bottom line for Mediterranean style diet represents pretty much what that picture is showing. So it's the removal of processed foods, eating foods that have what we call low, that low glycemic index. So something that doesn't just shoot up your blood sugar, like a bit of cake and then drop it and cause inflammation because sugar causes inflammation. There's a process that we call um, glycation and basically it binds to like your blood cells and causes changes. And that is why if you're diabetic, one of the blood tests that we do is something called hemoglobin 1C, A1C, and it looks at how glycated your blood cells are because the blood cells, the red blood cells live for an average of about three months and we can measure the amount of sugar that it, they attract and that are sticking to them as it were and change them. And that is one of the measurements that we use to diagnose uh, diabetes. So we want to be eating foods that have a low glycemic index. So something like things with a lot of fiber that is slow burning and gradually release energy rather than just shoot up lots of sugar and then cause inflammation in our bodies. And um, things that are high in omega-3 fatty acids, and we know that certain fish are high in these, we refer to them as smash fish. So salmon, mackerel, anchovies, sardines, herrings. These are some of the, the fish that we know that are high in fatty acids omega-3 fatty acids. We can get that from some plant food source as well, like flax seeds, seeds and nuts in general. Plant fats and fibers are what are very, very important. So again, somebody with, in talking about diet, low fat diet is one that was very, 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 very trendy and pushed some years ago. But we do need fat and it is when low fat diet is pushed that we end up having like things like sweeteners because they remove fat from things. But in order to maintain the taste, they introduce these sweeteners and you know we end up with problems. We do need fat. Our brain, when we remove the water content of the brain is predominantly fat. So there's good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Cholesterol is predominantly fatty. 
um, material, but we need those to make the cells in our body and our bodies. So the best source would be from plant fats like avocados, again, seeds and nuts, those sorts of things. So we do need the right kind of fat. Olive oil um, is a good source of, of fat. The alanoic acid that is supposed to be in it is again, the studies that support the Mediterranean style diet shows that that is very beneficial. And of course, reducing salt in our diet and alcohol, those have no, you know, no ends of um, inflammatory response. Alcohol directly affects our different organs, our liver, our brain, you know, too much of it. Caffeine is an interesting one because it does reduce blood supply for example, to the brain, and it can cause, you know, things like palpitations because of the release of certain hormones that it allows. But recently, I think just a month ago, um, I received an email about the fact that they've done recent studies which shows that certain caffeine, well, caffeine in general, but if you have, it is rather than saying that you should not have any caffeine, the recent research is suggesting that about two or three cups of coffee, coffee a day is actually beneficial. But having said that, it is recommended that you have it at certain times of the day. So for example, you wouldn't be having caffeine for, it's recommended like about two o'clock in the afternoon is when you would have your last cup because it will impact on your sleep, for example, if you're having it too late. But things are changing and there are always you know, different things coming to the fore because of ongoing research. But I put that in there just to, to, to highlight the fact that there's been new evidence around caffeine. But all the other things that I'm mentioning seem to be general principles that have remained over time. So reducing salt means using, you still want your food to be tasty. So it's using more herbs and spices and all the herbs and spices that we tend to use do have lots of medicinal properties. We going back to what Minister Case said about, you know, going back to natural sources. So the thyme and this onion and the garlic and the scallion that we use, those things are, are, have been found to have medicinal properties that are good for our bodies and certainly are better than using a lot of salt and artificial seasonings. But again, it means that we may have to change the way we, we season our foods because our taste buds need to adapt that way. And intermittent fasting is something, again, that has been shown to benefit us uh, in terms of maintaining very good health and reducing inflammation in our bodies and preventing all of these chronic diseases. And um, if you need to know more about that, we can talk about that later on, but I'm going to try and just quickly go through um, because time is going. Supplements, I wouldn't say go into Holland and Barrett and just pick up things, but a lot of research has been done which shows things like vitamin D to be quite beneficial, especially for individuals with darker skin because we tend to get benefit less from the sunlight. And just by living in this part of the world, this part of the equator where we get less sunlight, especially at certain time of the year, a lack of vitamin D has been shown not just to, to cause bone problems as we previously thought, but vitamin D does impact almost every cell in the body and specifically affects um, immunity. So vitamin D supplement is largely recommended. The NICE guidelines recommend a certain amount for just about everybody, but the, the, the correct thing to do if possible would to be to have a blood test to gauge what your exact level is and to be clear about exactly the amount to be taken. And I've just put that scripture there just to remind us that the Bible tells us our body is the temple of the living God and we're expected to look after it. So a lot there are about diet. Now the other lifestyle principles in terms of keeping healthy is about moving. And I've put move rather than just putting exercise because 
exercise versus activity. Some people say, oh, but I'm busy looking after my children. I'm running around, you know, I'm running after them every day and I'm busy doing this, that and the next. But that may be considered as activity. It basically um, relates to the amount of energy uh, that you, calories, I would say, that you end up burning as a result of the activity that you do. So it's important to keep active, you know, rather than sitting down and watching the TV. You, could, you can be moving your legs, you can be moving your toes, you can be moving your arms, that's activity. Every little helps, as I say, as Tesla said. But um, even that will help, but that does not necessarily substitute for proper exercise. So again, the recommendation is that exercise can be moderate, it can be mild, but moderate exercise of about half an hour for about at least five days a week is what is generally recommended. And it can take whatever form you fancy. You know, things like walking, dancing, hula hooping, I like to do that, aerobic exercises, swimming, Whatever you are able to do, and particularly what you enjoy doing is very, very important. Because a lot of us, I know there were times when I had a gym membership that I didn't necessarily use because I was so busy going to work, coming home. So if we can incorporate the exercise in what we're doing on, an, on a day-to-day -day basis, then it's better. If I have a, 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 an equipment that I use at home, my maxi climber, it's easy for me to get up in the morning and first thing, go downstairs, get on the maxi climber. It's done and I've done my exercises the first thing of the day. If I leave it to go to the gym later on, life will most likely get in the way. So it's about making it easy to do incorporate it in your day-to-day -day activities and if possible, doing something that you enjoy. And you can see all the, the benefits of exercise. It's, there are so many benefits to exercises. And like I said, if we were to put exercise in itself, in a pill form, it would be much, much, much more effective than some of the tablets that we take. Sleeping, I mentioned earlier on, is underrated. We don't value it enough. But again, we've had lots of studies from research that has shown the benefits of sleep. It's recommended as we're talking about exercise that you at least allow three hours before you go to sleep after any exercise because of the hormones that are produced, you're all hyped up. It could affect you falling asleep. Now, when we sleep, it's important to get not just quality sleep, but the type of sleep. Because as we sleep, our body goes through different phases. We get REM sleep where we have our dreams, but we also need deep sleep, which we sometimes refer to as our beauty sleep. And when that happens, certain processes occur. For example, there's a system that is referred to as the glymphatic system, which it's like the waste disposal system for the brain. Until we're getting enough sleep and getting deep sleep, that doesn't seem to come into play. But when it does, it like shampoos our brain. It reduces, it removes the toxins that are built up in our brain throughout the day. And specifically some proteins that cause, that are associated with Alzheimer's disease, tau protein, for example, those are removed with this system during deep sleep. And of course, when we sleep properly, the hormones in our body that regulate our weight are able to be regulated properly. So there's something called leptin and re and and re and lenin. Sorry, leptin and ghrelin. Those are two hormones that regulate our appetite and our hunger. And when we don't sleep properly, for example, if you're on a night duty, they go haywire and it affects your ability to lose weight. It affects how your weight is monitored and is, is measured. So sleep is very important. It is important to have a good sleep schedule. So it's, this, the studies have shown that it's best for our body 
if we go to bed and wake up the same time every day, even if we're not going to work. Again, that might be something that's difficult for some people, but as much as possible, again, I say every little helps. Whatever we can do from this list that I'm saying, then let's try and implement. Blue light is the effects that we get from using screens late at night. Basically the blue light that is emitted tells our brain that it is still daytime and the hormone melatonin is not produced. We need melatonin to help us to sleep. So blocking blue light is important. And when you get up in the morning, it's important to go and face the day, face the sunlight, pull the curtains. And that tells your brain it's daytime, melatonin levels drop and all the other hormones that you don't need for sleep will drop. And all these things are very important to maintain our health. Relaxation is something that we sort of think it's luxurious and we don't be, we're not deliberate or intentional about relaxation. I can't go into a lot of details, but what I will say to you is that we need to set aside time to relax. Relaxation, we talk about body, soul, and spirit, particularly affects our soul, which is our mind, our will, our emotion. When things are happening, we need to take time out to just take a deep breath. Again, simple things like breathing lowers cortisol level. Sometimes we're, not, we're just barely catching a breath because it's automatic. But when you stop, take a deep breath, like for four seconds, maybe hold it for two and then breathe out for another four, that does help. So just things like that. I've got and free thinking. So automatic, automatic um, negative thinking, we want to rid ourselves of that. Increasing our faith, that comes through studying the word of God. When we know what the word of God says and what the promises that our father has made to us, that reduces stress. And taking time to study the word of God, taking a quiet time, we might see just as affecting our spiritual well-being, but it affects our mind and our body as well. The Bible tells us that we should capture every thought, bring them into obedience unto Christ, and that Whatever things are pure, whatever things are honest, whatever things are good, those are what we should be thinking about. So talking about why somebody might get a heart attack when they're doing all the other things. If we're not relaxing enough, if we're not reducing our stress level, cortisol will be at an all time high in our body. It will cause inflammation and it will wreak havoc in our body. Exposure to nature is... Um, is one very good way of relaxing. So even if you live in the city, go walk in the park. Recently, they've said that just bringing a plant in your house, having a, a picture of nature, these things help. So again, every little help. We talked about financial pressures at this time. Getting, if you're not sure about finances, recently in our convocation, there was a session about finances, it's on YouTube, you can go and watch it. But I personally have had to take control of my finances because I used to just go to work, 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 work. And my husband used to be the one to look after finances and I had no idea what was going on with my finances. That's not a good thing. Um, I mean, if you've got, if you're a couple and you decide about how to manage your finances and that's working for you, then that is good. But it is important that we pay attention to do these things because money, let's face it, plays a big role in our well being. The Bible says, money answereth all things. And if we don't have enough of it and we're struggling every day about money, it causes increased stress. And again, the raised cortisol and the inflammation, and we're putting ourselves at risk. So don't neglect looking after finances and just being able to have a voice, you know, not being in a situation where you're being overpowered and controlled um, is important. In a work environment, as somebody mentioned, 
if you find that you're in a situation where you feel like you, you're, you're, you don't have a voice, don't just not do anything. You need to find a strategy, a way of addressing that issue. I talk about purpose. When we know what our purpose is in life, um, it makes a big difference about staying well, about keeping healthy. If you're just sort of just trudging through life, just going like a ship without a sail, that increases stress, that is not good for our well being. The Bible, I like to use the acronym SHAPE, and I get that from Rick Warren's book, A Purpose Driven Life. And SHAPE refers to S, is for our spiritual gifts. H is for heart, which refers to our passion. A is for our abilities. P is for our personality, and E is for experiences. All of these come put together equal our ministry. And when we have a ministry and we engage our ministry, we have a purposeful life and that makes a difference in us remaining healthy. And just I put epitaph there and I just want us to think if you had just, if you were told you've got a year to live or maybe a month or whatever, what would you do different? And at the end of the day, what it is that you would like to be on your epitaph? When you've left the surf, what do you want to be said? Sometimes we have to remember about not sweating the small things and taking time out to relax. And relationships is a very, very big thing. I realize that time is going, so I'm going to wrap up. But do not underestimate the value of relationship. God has put us together. We are here this evening as a church. Somebody talk about the lack of the family structure. Those things should not be underestimated. And where it is possible, engage in it because no man is an island. If you're in a relationship that you find is not good for you, don't just ignore it. Do something about it. Have a talk, have a discussion, address these things because it makes a difference. And in terms of relationship, things like having good people around you who will join you in doing healthy things like join you in going for a walk join you in looking after your your children helping you with all these things that we've we've mentioned somebody who will join you in having a good healthy discussion rather than gossiping those things are important and impact on us staying healthy so my references are the bible i've not quoted many scripture but i can tell you that if you should go through the Bible. We've got lots of health principles in there. And all that, the, the other things that I've mentioned that you can see here on my screen. So at this time, we own, I don't know how much time we've got for questions, but I will stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Carol. Uh, we do have quite a few questions. So I'm just going to go straight into them. Uh, the first one, what advice or encouragement can be given to those who oppose to take medication that are prescribed for conditions such as high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera, especially for people of Afro-Caribbean background and within the church whom share these views okay so i think we alluded to that earlier on and i use myself as an example i am a child of god i know the word of god and the promises god promised about healing us in their many scriptures but if it is a case that my faith is not at the place at this point where i will omit my medications i'm not there and because i know that i'm not there I believe that God will heal me through the medications that he's allowed mankind to have the, the knowledge and the wisdom and the ability to create. And my experience is that I have taken, my, I have to take about 11 tablets every day. It's not nice, it's a nuisance sometimes, but I take them because they help me to stay healthy. And so my advice is if you're prescribed your medications, then do, and take them unless they're causing you side effects 
if they're causing side effects, then go back to your GP, discuss, because not every medication um, agree. If, you know, we, we shouldn't be taking medications that we don't need. And so a lot of people that I speak to, for example, are on certain tablets like Tablets to protect your stomach, lansoprazole is an example. A lot of people are on it because at one point they had some heartburn, whatever, and the doctor prescribed it and they stay on it forever. Those can alter like your gut microbiome that I talk about and can cause problems for you. So if you don't need to be on medications, then you don't, then you shouldn't be taking medications that you don't need. If you don't need antibiotics, don't take antibiotics. Some people, come and demand antibiotics, but it's not always the best thing because if you've got a viral infection, you don't need antibiotics. So be guided by your health professionals. And I would say adhere to your medication regime unless your faith is such that you are you know, assured and you know, and you believe that you will get your healing another way but I would advise my patients or advise anyone to take medications that are prescribed. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is, how do you recommend eating healthily when you have multiple food allergies? It's not possible for me to eat nuts, coconut or several fruits. Do you have any recommendations for how I, how I can eat more healthily? Oh dear, that's, 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 that's a shame. Ooh, I think again, like I said, dietary is an individual thing. And I cannot just blankly say, eat this, this, this. If you do have food allergies, you need to be working with a dietitian or nutritionist. And that is what I would advise that you seek out with your GP to try and get um, referred and work it that way. Because if you do have allergies, it can obviously make things worse. So that, that would be my recommendation. And that's why I said it's individualized. Thank you very much. Uh, we have been accused as the church of being overly spiritual at the neglect of our physical bodies. How much responsibility does the church have to teach about physical health? <laughs> I think we have a lot of responsibilities. That's why I started with the scripture where we're encouraged by Paul to maintain not just spiritual health, but that when the Lord returns, he would like us to be our body, soul, and spirit to be preserved. And in 1 Corinthians 6, where I, I read that scripture, we're reminded that our bodies are the temple of God. And so we glorify God in our bodies as well. If you're not well, we are God's hands and feet on this earth. And if I'm sick in bed, I can't minister as much as I can if I am not sick in bed. You know, I might be able to pick up the phone and encourage people. And if that's your, if that's your reality, do whatever you can. I talk about your shape. What if, you know, if your experience is such that you've had, you've had a, a, something happen to you, use that experience to minister. But the reality is that the, the, the healthier we are, the better ambassadors for Christ we can be. So I do think we have a significant responsibility and I applaud you for the sessions that you're having. And, you know, I'm honored to be here to, to help in this way. Thank you very much. Another question. As a church, I know we, must, we mainly fast for spiritual benefits, but surely there is a great benefit for fasting for your physical health. What are the benefits? Okay. So you see, again, God is so wonderful. And I talk about spending time to study the word because in it, in there are it's eternal life. There are so many good life principles. There is, there is something called the Daniel plan and some people take it to the Daniel fast. But it, it, that Daniel plan is about a lifestyle that is based on diet, but also 
incorporating your faith and your focus on God and friends getting brethren included. But one of the things that the Bible talks about, you know, for our spiritual well-being, and I'm sure when God said it, he knew that it would help us physically as well, is, is fasting. So again, fast, when we fast, it allows our body to use the extra calories that we store. We're in a Western society where we're not, food most times is not an issue. Most times we have too much food and so we overeat. If we have too many calories in the food that we're taking, our body stores it and it stores it as fat. If we're constantly laying down more fat and not allowing our body to use this, the, the fat that it's stored, we become obese. That is generally the principle. Sometimes people may have other hormonal problems, but generally that is the reason why when most people are overweight. If we fast, and at least when we fast for about 12 hours, we allow our body to go into a fasting state and then that kicks in, I suppose you could call it the ketogenic state where the body starts using the fat that is laid down. It is also believed that fast reduces the amount of um, inflammation that occurs in our bodies. It allows the body to reduce inflammation because I think because maybe because it's resting because food can be inflammatory. If you eat too much sugar, like I explained earlier on, that's an inflammatory process. So if that's not there and you're fasting, the inflammation level will be reduced. And of course, if that is reduced, the cells will be working properly. The systems by, by extension will be working properly and generally you will have very good health. And I'm sure there are probably some more unique ones that I can't think of right now. But generally speaking, it allows our body to go into fast. It reduces inflammation and that covers a myriad of pathological things that occur in our body. Thank you. On the back of that, this question came in. Do we, do we need to be mindful of natural sugars in fruits? Okay, no, that, that is something that I, I don't think I still have very clear evidence about. Suffice it to say, we are advised not to have more than about a fistful of fruits in terms of the fruit portions. Because again, if we're having fruits, even though it's natural sugars, if it is a spike, where it suddenly goes up. So we eat a big mango or 10 mangoes or whatever. It's a big uh, glucose load because that's how our body, it's fruct fructose is the sugar in the fruits, but it will eventually be stored as, as glucose. And that spike can be inflammatory and our liver has to process it and all of that. So it is recommended that we don't have too much at a time. Even though we're meant to have the portions, some we, we say at least five. In fact, um, some recommendation would go as far as saying rather than five portions of fruits, have more vegetables than fruit, because it is felt that too much of the fructose, especially if it is significantly risen quickly, can cause inflammation and put too much burden on the liver, for example, to process process it. Thank you very much. Coming down, um, are there different nationalities or are different nationalities prone to different diseases or conditions? Yes. And that is about, I think it's probably genetics, but also environment. So we know, for example, that people of um, South Asian and Afro-Caribbean origin, we tend to get diabetes, for example, more so than the Caucasian population. But the Caucasian population, for example, would be probably more, get, tend to get more heart attacks than, than stroke. So we, as a black population, there seems to be a higher prevalence of stroke than heart attack, for example. So some things 
and some some inflammatory disease like inflammatory bowel disease tend to be more prevalent in Caucasian populations. Also. So so there seems to be some things that are more prevalent in certain ethnic groups. I think it is a combination of genetics and environment, but environment includes, again, economic situations come into play as well, toxins. So if you live near the road where you know, there are lots of vehicles going up and down, we saw this case of this woman who was fighting for her daughter who died of asthma and she was convinced that it's because of the, the um, the air that she was that that she was breathing in near to where they live. So a lot of factors come into play. But yes, there are different prevalences in different ethnicities. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you recommend anything that would stop legs or the back of the legs and thigh muscle cramps at night? It's very painful. Okay, <laughs> so we know cramps can be as a result of a number of conditions, for example, what we call electrolytes. So electrolytes refers to the salts in our bodies like sodium and calcium and all of those things. So it's a lack of some electrolytes can cause cramps. So if you're having cramps, I would say that you need to check with your doctor to at least have a blood test to check your electrolytes to see whether it is a case of low calcium or low sodium or not so much sodium, but whether there are electrolyte imbalances and then take it from there. Um, exercises may help, it depends. And um, just because exercises increases blood flow to muscles and if there's increased blood flow, it may help. Um, increasing circulation by using something like a hot water bottle may help. It's just things that you could try. And of course, there are also tablets that can be taken but I would, but again, this should only be prescribed only after we've ascertained what the underlying problem is. So to, to start with, I would say activity and methods of increasing blood flow, like using a, a hot water bottle, for example. But you do need to get it checked by your doctor. Thank you very much. This is a specific, uh, it's, like a, it's like a comment really. Uh, it's not so much a question, but they're just letting you know of an experience they had visiting a friend who was in hospital and they just had some concerns. And then the last thing I'm gonna say after this is a comment that came concerning the presentation tonight. So if you bear with me, it's kind of long. I visited a friend over the weekend who was rushed into hospital for losing blood in her body. And in the past eight weeks, on one occasion, received a blood transfusion. Yeah. On her last admission, the doctors discovered her veins in her body were thinning and worn out, causing the blood to leak into her stomach due to the warfarin that she was taking over the 20 years. And they took her off the warfarin immediately without weaning her off, which she was afraid to do. I have been telling her for years to take lemon and water and to thin her blood after her heart replacement surgery. For years, I told her to come off the swarfrin and the health and on health matters on radio four, they said medications is not for life, but should only be taken up to three or four years and to come off. And it was said that at a GP surgery, they should tell patients that they should be weaned off it after four years. So she just had some concerns and wanted to make a comment. Okay, so there are quite a few things in that. <laughs> there are some medications that theoretically are meant to be for life. If when you get older, for example, if when I get to 80 and 90, I have to make a decision as to whether I'm gonna continue taking my atorvastatin, that's my statin. I take statin, it's prescribed to me, it's expected that I take it for life because it helps to keep the cholesterol level down. My cholesterol level was normal when I had the heart attack, but they still give it to me because they know that it keeps the cholesterol level down, but it also, what we call, it keeps the, the plaque that is, that, that is formed in the heart stable. 
So what happens when you get a heart attack is that the plaque ruptures and you start getting um, bleeding in the artery. So cholesterol and atrovastatin, for example, keeps that. It's like a Teflon coats the lining of the artery, the, the, the artery and prevents a plaque um, from rupturing or reduces the chance. So because of that, I take it. But there are some side effects. Now, I have to make the decision about balancing some people get more side effects than others. So if it was if it were affecting my legs so much so that I couldn't walk, because some people get cramps, another cause as well for leg cramps. Then I would have to make a decision about stopping it. But because I don't have any of those and I know what the benefit is, I carry on taking it and I'm expected to take it. It's to be a lifelong illness, just like some of the other medications that I take for my heart. So there are some medications that theoretically are meant to be lifelong. Warfarin, for example, depending on what it is used for, may be a lifelong medication. We don't just give people warfarin and leave them on it without monitoring it. There's a blood test that is called INR, which is International Normalized Ratio. Wherever you go in the world, you can have your INR checked. When I went to Jamaica on holidays and I was on warfarin because I had a clot in my heart after I had the heart attack, they were able to do that blood test and I could determine what dose of warfarin to take. So if you're on warfarin, you're meant to be having regular INR checks done. You're meant to have a target for which your INR is. So it's, for example, if you've had a heart valve, it will be a little bit higher. So it might be say two to three, or yeah, two to two is a very common one. Or three, you most most like most times three is the the upper number. But there is a target, and you're usually told your target, your INR target. If it's lower than the target, it means that you're at risk of developing a clot. If it's higher than the target, it means you're at risk of bleeding. So people shouldn't be on warfarin and be left alone. If you're on warfarin, you're being monitored. Your blood test is done for some people weekly, for some people longer, and not sure if up to a month, depending on how stable you are. I, I don't know about lemon and water being good for thinning the blood. It probably is, but I do not have enough evidence to say to somebody, come off your warfarin and take lemon. I think that would be considered of me to be negligent if I, as a doctor, tell somebody to do that. So there are lots of things in what that individual has said. And I think it needs to be dealt with an, on an individual basis. But the, the doctor, obviously, the doctor need to be a part of the discussion. And I think there are some clarifications, perhaps, that are necessary here. Thank you so much, Dr. Carroll. This one just came in. I have I have a hard time persuading my male family members to go to the doctor when they are ill. What can I do? <laughs> Goodness, it is not. It is a. It is a thing. Most men, when they come to the doctor, they said, "Me only come because my wife said <laughs> the Caribbean ones." But most one, most men will tell you. I'm here because my wife asked me to come or my wife sends me. It is a thing with male that they tend to be reluctant, more reluctant than the female or female species to seek medical help. Um, just point out that um, some things can be prevented if they are identified earlier than later. So, when we turn 40, for example, in England, there's a free health check that we can all have. It's called the NHS health check. And for what it's worth, it's like an MOT. And you can go and have blood tests done to check for diabetes, get your blood pressure check, your cholesterol check. All of those things can be done. And if it's identified that you're, for example, at risk of diabetes, my goodness, it is worth knowing that than not knowing and develop diabetes full blown. Diabetes is a condition that it's an inflammatory condition. Once you have it, you're at risk of getting 
so many other things. And if it's not controlled properly, you are, the complications are just very, very, very difficult to, it makes your life difficult. You can have end up with losing limbs in lots of pain, losing your vision. You end up being more prone to getting heart, attack, heart attacks. And if you get COVID, for example, you're more at risk of getting so of getting um, complications from it. So it's certain things that can be identified early could be picked up and you could save yourself a lifetime of misery knowing certain things. So even though you may feel very, very healthy and feel at your best, it is, it is worth doing, for example, that health check, it's like a screening. Or if you're, having, if you're having symptoms, don't ignore it. I know we're in a situation at the moment where it's very difficult to get, get appointments with your GP. But if you've got a symptom, do not ignore it. If you can't get an appointment with your GP, you can call 111. And through 111, you can get an appointment at a hub, an urgent care center, or we can send it to a &E if it's an acute problem and we think you need to go. So nobody should have a symptom that isn't treated. So just think that you're not yet immortal. You're still living in your earth suit. And so you're, you're prone to all sorts. And it is your responsibility to do what you can to minimize your health risks. That's wonderful. That's, you can only encourage people, really. <laughs> But I would Wonderful. And this is the final question, Dr. Carr. I think you kind of answered it just now, but nevertheless, uh, just to make sure that the person heard the question, how often should you visit your doctor if you're relatively healthy and aren't having any serious health issues? Okay, so like you said, that, that came out. So generally speaking, it's at, at around age 40, unless you're having symptoms, unless you're having problems, then at age 40, we recommend that everybody gets their health MOT done. And depending on the findings, then the, 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 the frequency with which you visit your doctor will be determined. If all is well, nothing is found, then we recommend that you have that check done at least like every five years. But that's a starting point. But I will, I will stress again, I will reiterate that if you're having symptoms, if something is not quite right, you know your body more than anybody else. And if something isn't quite right, have a chat. Go see somebody about it. Don't um, suffer in silence. It's better to be safe than sorry. When I had my health check at 40, it was lovely and clear. And I was, according to the, 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 risk, the risk factor, I was expected to live up to my, in, up until about 80 years old before having anything like a heart attack. It so happened that I end up with a heart attack at age 48. My blood pressure was normal. My cholesterol was normal. Everything was normal. But I would say to you that I think that my body withstood it and did so well because I was doing my exercises. I was eating healthily. What I was not accounting for enough were things like my sleep. I was working all sorts of hours, night duty all over the place, doing all sorts. It's, come, it's part and parcel of my job. But I wasn't aware that it was having those kind of effects on me. Um, stress from different points in my life were there and I sometimes, in some cases I was aware but didn't pay enough attention. So like I said, be deliberate about um, stress busting measures, relaxation, be deliberate about your sleep and be deliberate about all the lifetime things, be deliberate about your relationship. How are they affecting you? Are they impacting you? About, you know, about your work environment, all of those things must come into play. So it's all about um, looking at all of those to remain healthy. And if you're having any symptoms, discuss it with your doctor. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Carol. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And this one comment before I hand back to Sister Carol Cameron uh, for the vote of thanks. It says, praise the Lord. I have thoroughly enjoyed the portions of this session that I was able to hear. Thank you so much. I am listening from Youngstown, Ohio, USA. Oh, that's lovely. Thank God. We thank God. Amen. Uh, and I'll hand over back to Sister Carol. Bless you, Sister Erica. And I'm going to go straight over to Sister Lowe for the thanks and summary for this evening. Praise the Lord, everyone. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's open our mic and just give Dr. Carol a big round of applause, please. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. And to uh, Dr. In Inghofosi, let me do it right. <laughs> <laughs> Just another time, we'll always short her name and call her Dr. Carl, is, you know, not to say anything unusual or yeah. anything funny. But um, we are grateful tonight to have had you on. And um, whatever you've said tonight came home a lot because um, many people are going through different, different crises during this time. And especially after COVID, you, you could see the decline in many people's um, health. And um, we got grateful tonight for your input and your session, which was really, really good. And we think we are blessed to have had you on. And we are so grateful that you could open up our knowledge and, and um, give us all this information. For me, it has um, served me a lot because I am from a family with um, heart attack diabetes, high blood pressure, and you name it. But tonight, I am grateful to hear you. And you know what? I'm, I'm so thankful to you to accept the invitation. You didn't. We, we, we haven't met before. But thanks to Dr. Mike, who introduced you to us. And I am really, really grateful that you really accept because we were at a point where we really needed somebody to do this session. We are much grateful. Thanks for all those lovely information. Tonight, we have had 84 devices on, and we, we are truly happy that you could come to enlighten us. And thank you for taking your precious time. When I spoke to you Saturday, you were still on duty, and you came away and said you're dying for some sleep. And you, in your, in your um, talking tonight, you say how important sleep is. And I think all of us need to have some good sleep because many of times we're just bobbing around, not doing anything, but we, we need to know the importance of sleep. So that I'm thankful for my partner, um, um, Elder Dunkley, and for our own presiding Bishop, Bishop um, Linton. Thank you for being on, sir. We thank you for Overseer Danny, um, Diedrich, and all the other ministers, Sister K, or Minister K, and Mother Dawkins, we thank you and all the other ministers, wherever might be coming from. Sister Carol, um, Cameron, we thank you very much for stepping in and for doing the moderating for us tonight. I, I was a bit in a frenzy tonight because I went over to Kent to see my cousin, my sick cousin, and I didn't know if I would get back on time for the session, but thank God I made it. I, I was so happy. Thank you, Sister Erica and all the comms team for working so hard, so hard. Yes, we have one more session to go. And, and after that, um, Sister Kay or Sister Erica might enlighten us more, but that's next week, Monday, which will be a spin-off. I think Sister Kay with our Sister Erica will better explain that for us. Um, looking forward for that last one. We have to put in one, we should stop tonight, but because of popular demand, we, we, we are going to open up to next week, Monday. And that is, Adult session again. Adult session is only for adults, and um, the the comes team will um, explain that. Bishop Linton, I don't know if you want to say anything. Um, after that, we're going to hand over back to Sister Erica, and then we're going to ask Elder Diedrich to pray and close in prayer. So, Bishop Linton, I don't know if you need you want to say any comments or anything. Thank you so much, Sister Low. I'm very honored. I'm trying not to have to speak every time, but thank you for the opportunity. It's been a joy to listen to Dr. Carol. I met her on one earlier occasion when I heard her testimony. So to, to, to have her come on the platform tonight, it was a blessing and very, very informative 
One of the things I do always when anyone is speaking, regardless of how young, I take notes. And I did four pages of notes tonight and um, <laughs> convicted me about my lack of sleep. I, I really make every, every year a new resolution, but tonight I've resolved again. I definitely need to get more sleep. Finally, somebody asked the question, does the church have a responsibility? I seem to think there's a lot coming the way of the pastors and bishops, but I would just like to say, look at us. We, we, we carry ourselves well, we, we dress well, we look a picture of health, we take exercise. So if you watch us, you will do well. God bless you, Sister Karen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bishop um, we, we are grateful to everyone who came on on Zoom, um, the 84 um, persons that we have had on. We need just need to thank you, the 84 devices that we've had. We are grateful. Those from coming from America, Jamaica, all around. We just so, so grateful to you all. Thank you very much. Um, over to um, the comms team. Thank you. We're just going to go into some announcements before I hand over to Elder Diedrich to do the closing prayer. Just a minute. Good evening, everyone. Um, whilst we're waiting to get the system back up and running with the uh, announcements, we'd like to inform you of next week, Monday. Um, Monday the 31st of October, we will be having a part two of the session that we had last week, which was about what men and women wish they understood about each other. So now by popular demand, this session is going to be a Q&A panel. And so we're asking everybody, please, to send in your questions to info at beulahapostolicchurch.org.uk. And I'd like you, please, to send in any questions you have regarding relationships, marriage, courtship. We will have a wonderful panel selected who will be able to take your questions. And so please do start sending them in. It will be an adult only session, okay? 18 years and above. Um, it will be down to parental discretion. If you feel that you have perhaps a 16 year old who you would like to join the session, that is down to parental discretion only, but please, it is an over 18 adult session only. Um, so please, we are asking that everybody start logging on from 7 p.m., 7 p.m., okay? This will give us time to verify that you are over 18, and then we'll be able to move you into the breakout room where the main session will begin at 7.30. To make the process easier, we are asking if you could just come on on camera. That way we can just see that you're over 18 and you'll go straight in swiftly. Please don't be alarmed if there is a bit of a delay in getting into the breakout room. We are just going through the process of putting people in. So don't log off, just stay where you are and you will enter the session in a timely fashion as soon as we can. So please, you are welcome to invite others and share, okay? Send in your questions at info at beulahapostolicchurch.org.uk. The panel are ready and waiting to take your questions and we're gonna have a grand evening. So I hope we are all looking forward to that. Uh, the session last week was a very informative, interactive and, and quite a spicy one, <laughs> if I can use that word. And so all the sessions are recorded. So please do, if you have missed anything of the past Mondays, please do check us out on the Beulah Apostolic Church channel on YouTube. Okay, so um, that's the announcement for next week, Monday, when we're discussing relationships, marriage, courtship, about men, about women, all of that good stuff, okay? And God's point of view. So please do join us next week, Monday at 7.30. Um, until then, please start spreading the word, okay? 
Um, also, whilst I still believe the system is down, so what we're going to do, I'm just going to carry on with the announcements. If we were in our buildings and we would be collecting an offering, so we're asking, please, if you have been blessed by this ministry, the series that we have been doing, the Health Matters Mondays, then you are welcome to bless this area of ministry. Uh, so you can give at paypal.me forward slash BACUK. When you go to the website, you can use your debit or credit card. Okay, please do bless us as the Lord has blessed you. And thank you to everybody who's been giving. Please use the reference HMM. And that way the money will be allocated to this particular ministry and we thank you in advance. Okay. And I believe that's the end of the announcements. Next Sunday, we continue in Beulah Wilsdon with the family month. Okay. And this is going to be a general celebration of the family. So we're asking everybody if you don't have your own assembly to attend, Next Sunday, Sunday coming, please do join the Beulah Wilsden branch where they are having the grand finale, the last family Sunday of this month of October, the focus on the family. So come out, enjoy, invite a friend, tell a friend to tell a friend, bring the family out and be blessed by God. And we will see you again next Monday for the close. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Minister Erica will close us out in prayer. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We give thanks with a grateful heart. We thank you, Almighty God, for everything that has been done here this evening. We thank you for those who join. We thank you for our presenter, Dr. Carol. We pray you will continue to bless her. She has shared of her testimony. She has shared of the healing in her life. We pray as children of God, we will take heed how we can live better and put it into practice, not only be hearers, but doers. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We are stirred and we have the mind to do what is right for the temple that you have blessed us with. We pray even as we separate the one from each other, you will continue to bless us individually and collectively. Take all the glory. It belongs to you, almighty God, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory as we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen.